Well, hello everybody. Yes, another edition of Zoom Landlord Tenant Talk Radio. It is August 24th, 2024. And you know we do this every Saturday, wherever I am. I think next week I'm going to be doing this, believe it or not. And I'm the guy who doesn't like to travel, but I don't understand why I keep traveling. But I've got a wedding in Napa, so I'll be doing this from some hotel in Napa. But anyway, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, the song of the day was Mrs. Robinson. It was from a soundtrack from a movie called The Graduate. Great movie. If you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it in a long time, I suggest you go to Netflix and watch it. And of course, it was performed by Simon and Garfunkel. I know I'm old, ladies and gentlemen. I only take the old music, but you know, what can I do? Um, in any event, I do want to give a big shout out to the Apartment Owners Association and also for all the attendees that, are, that, are, that came to the Long Beach Convention Center. We had an unbelievable turnout uh, for the trade show. And of course, I was speaking uh, at 1.15 that day and the uh, crowd was incredible, standing room only and very appreciative. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, I was kind of kidding in the last uh, show, and I actually had six people who asked me for a selfie. So I was uh, uh, taken aback by that and a lot of well-wishers. So I'm very, very appreciative of you guys uh, turning out and uh, making this just was a, just a great event. Okay, let's talk. My opening topic today is... Avoid being sued by your tenant. Avoid being sued by your tenant. There are marauding uh, attorneys that are looking to sue landlord. Generally, it's over these habitability issues, and uh, they'll bring forth a lawsuit. Uh, maybe you have insurance, maybe you don't. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you sleepless nights. And sometimes it's almost impossible to avoid these lawsuits, even for the landlords that are doing the best job they possibly can do. Uh, these tenants are just sitting there and looking for a payday. And of course, they're, they're not going to be suing some homeless guy in the street. They're going to be suing the guy that has the money. And of course, that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with uh, you guys right now. So... Um, I have come up with some ideas that are, aren't exactly going to s prevent you from ever getting sued, but it will certainly lessen the possibility. So what are those? Number one, when you are leasing out property, make sure that, uh, of course, they're going to fill out an application, but make sure every adult is going to fill out that application. You want to know who you're renting to who you're renting to, and that might give you some clues as to why you should stay away from these people, that these people are prone to bring forth lawsuits against you. So again, when you're renting out a unit, you want to make sure that each and every adult fills out that application. And of course, you also want to do a credit check. You know, desperate people, people that don't have much wherewithal, those are the ones who are bringing forth the lawsuit. Rarely are you going to see rich people bringing forth lawsuits against their landlords. It's usually those who are just looking for a free ride. So you want to run a credit check against uh, every adult who's moving into your unit. But one important thing about the credit check, and I know the Apartment Owners Association does this, and also you can kind of do it yourself. You want to do a civil lawsuit check. So you could go, for example, in Los Angeles County, you go to the Los Angeles Superior Court, go online and you want to do a plaintiff defendant check. You want to see if your applicant is prone to either being sued or filing lawsuits against anybody. What if you found out that this applicant had filed four lawsuits against his previous landlords? You think you want that guy in your building? And the answer is no, you don't. So as part of that credit check, make sure you do a civil lawsuit check. The Apartment Association can do it as well. And also, um, you can also go to the uh, Los Angeles Superior website or Orange County websites, the county court website, and you'll be able to, uh, to determine if this guy's been in a bunch of lawsuits, either as a plaintiff and a defendant. Either way, 
These are people to avoid, okay? And by the way, when you're doing that application and credit check, there's a lot of people out there that are using other people's information, their social, their name. And even if you ask for a driver's license, it is so easy to manufacture a driver's license that looks legitimate and there's really no way to tell. So uh, my son, who heads up our collection department, gave me this idea, and that is, as part of the collection check, you want to make sure that the cell phone number that your applicant is giving to you relates to his name and his social security. If it doesn't, then that means he's using somebody else's credit. Now, the guy in front of you, that applicant, is going to have to give you his cell phone number, right? So make sure that you run that, that telephone as part of the credit check. And the, I know the Apartment Owners Association does that, where they will match that that phone number relates to the person who's standing in front of you. So you're not going to get some random person that is uh, trying to gain access to your property. That's a whole nother problem. Okay. As you know, every adult who's moving into your unit must sign the rental agreement. There should be a term in your rental agreement, or you can actually do it by way of a change of terms of tenancy. And I know that's on my website. And of course, my rental agreement is on my website, evict123.com. That's E-V-I-C-T 123.com. And you want to make sure that it has all the terms in there that will prevent you or help prevent you from getting sued. One important term that should be in your rental agreement is that you require that all repair requests, excepting for emergencies, be in writing. All repair requests. This way, when you get sued and they're saying what a slumlord you are, and of course your position is, hey, the guy never told me anything. If he had, I would have been happy to fix it. But they make up all these stories. So by having that term in your rental agreement that all repair requests are in writing, we can then prove that the tenant never asked you to fix anything. And that goes a long way to defeating these types of lawsuits. Also, and most importantly, you want to document all interactions with your tenant. If your tenant asks you to fix a garbage disposal, you immediately send him a, an email, if he has email, or send him a note where you're documenting that you asked me to fix the garbage disposal on Tuesday. I had the guy in on Thursday, job completed. Thank you for alerting me that there was something wrong with my apartment. Every time this tenant asks you something or tells you something, you want to document that because this is what's going to save you when you're getting sued for these habitability claims, which are so prevalent now, which by the way are making our insurance pre premiums go through the roof. Even if the guy walks by you and says, thank you, document that. Okay, maybe not that one, but at the very minimum, document everything he asked you to do. Even if you can't do it, say, you asked me to uh, change your carpeting. I looked at the carpeting, it wasn't torn, it wasn't worn through, it wasn't frayed and I did not do it. So you're going to document this. If, for example, the tenant is complaining about mold, do yourself a big favor. Don't worry about the expense of a mold test. Take a look at it, and if there's any possibility, get yourself a mold guy in there immediately, and then make sure that it tests negative so you have that report, okay? Because a lot of times they're suing landlords over mold. And you want to make sure that if there's any possibility, do not wait. You want to do this immediately. And if there is a problem, guess what? You get it fixed. Now, to chastise some landlords here, if a tenant's telling you he's got a problem with the plumbing on Monday, and you schedule somebody there the next week, my position is you're out of your mind. If the guy tells you on Monday that there's a plumbing problem, what the hell are you waiting for? Call the plumber the same day, the same day. Get them in the same day. Document what a great landlord you are. I know you guys are concerned about expenses, but is it really less costly if the plumber comes next week versus the same day? There is no difference in expense. You're going to have to do it anyway, and we have to look like we're the most uh, ethical, moral, great businessmen, because the media makes us out as terrible people, 
Uh, the politicians make us out as terrible people. The tenants lie that we're tenant people. The only one who supports landlords is us. So we have to look like we're going overboard to be concerned about any repair request. This is what's going to save you in this lawsuit, that you documented it, that all repair requests had to be in, in, act, in, in writing. So you have a trail that can prove that, hey, I'm a good landlord. I did what I said. Even if the tenant, you serve an access notice, hey, I'm going to go in to make the repair, and the tenant won't let you in. Document that. Send the tenant a letter. Say, you know, you asked for something to be fixed. I served you an access notice to go in on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and you refused to let me in. I find this very curious. Send them that email. Send them that letter. You want to document everything that this tenant did. So we have a wonderful paper trail when you do have a situation where you're getting sued. Now, the other side of the coin is... If a tenant's not acting right, the tenant's not following the terms of the rental agreement, he's just giving you a bad time, that's a red flag right there. These are the types of tenants where you let it fester and fester, and eventually these are the tenants that's going to be uh, attempting to sue you. If you've got a tenant that's violating the terms of his rental agreement, you should take action immediately. Get rid of that tenant. If a tenant is nice, following the terms... That's great. Those tenants aren't the ones who are generally going to come after you. But those tenants that are violating the terms of their rental agreement, not following the rules, disturbing other tenants, these are the tenants that you should not wait on, not let it build up, but take legal action if you have the ability and the right under the law to do so to get rid of these people. And the last thing I need to talk to you about with regard to avoid being sued by your tenant would be to review your insurance policy. It's the only thing that's the last stand between your money and the tenant. And that is make sure that you have a good insurance policy, that it covers everything that you could possibly think of. If you have to spend more for it, unfortunately, it's just the cost of doing business because I'm telling you as a, as a person being involved with landlords where they're getting sued, the uh, awards against landlords are crazy, a half a million, 250,000. It, it's, it's just like, you know, let's make a deal with Monty Hall. So in that situation, ladies and gentlemen, review your insurance policies and make sure, and I know it's tough to get insurance, but review your insurance policies to make sure that you have the proper insurance. Okay, that concludes my topic of the day, which is avoid being sued by your tenant. Please listen to what I'm saying, because quite frankly, you're really not going to like it when you get served with a lawsuit. We are now going to open it up to questions. Let's go through the ground rules. This Zoom meeting is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended as legal advice. If you do have a question, it's simple to ask it. All you got to do is electronically raise your hand, look at the toolbar on your Zoom thing, and click on that hand, and I will get try to get to everybody today. And last but not least, if you've got a case with my law firm, we do not talk about specific cases. This form is just for general questions on landlord-tenant law. And with that, I'm going to open it up to our first invitee, Dorian. Please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Dennis. Thank you for picking me and uh, for your generosity, uh, especially during your cruise. I have never met any professional much less an attorney who would take me on his vacation as you have. And I really enjoyed it on many levels. <laughs> so well, you'll get, to, you'll get to see the hotel room in Napa next week. <laughs> and, and even meet the significant other. That was wonderful. Oh, yes. I mean, yes. This, is, this was block. It was great. So uh, so uh, I, I have a place, a condo that's um, trying to rent right now in Los Angeles City. It's not under RSO. But I noticed that I have a lot of professional buildings next to me where the some kind of Wall Street company owns the entire building. And now, right now, they're all giving concessions like, uh, you know, $100, $200, one month for rent. They're all different, but they're all given. And I was wondering if I wanted to compete with them and give a concession, say, $100 a month for a year lease or $200. Is that possible for a person like me, like owns a single condo? And uh, is there any law against it? Because I don't know what, what they're doing it or how they're doing it, but I've never done it before. Okay, well, first of all, 
Uh, right now, as the law stands, and by the way, vote no on Proposition 33 and vote yes on Proposition 34. But right now, there is no rent limitations on a condo. So if you rent the premises out, for example, and you wanted to get $2,000, but you're going to give them a $100 rent concession for the first year, you can rent it out for $1,900. And then after the first year, unless the law changes, you would be able to raise the rent to whatever you like after the first year, that okay. once the lease concludes. If, uh, for example, this was a, a rent controlled unit, you could write that the rent is $2,000 and then I would have an addendum to the rental agreement that states that for the first year you're getting a $100 discount. So, which means that they'll pay $1,900 for the first year. I think that's that's permissible, but you certainly have the right to do that, Dorian. Okay. okay. I appreciate it. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. You take care. We are going to move on to a regular and someone who uh, shook my hand at the Long Beach Convention Center. Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm doing good, Dennis. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Regular habit here. <laughs> it appears. Okay, I, got, I got, I love it. It's the highlight of my Saturday. It really is. I'm a <laughs> nerd. So, uh, two questions. Regarding what you're talking about, about getting sued, so this is not unlawful detainer suit. It's it's something else. If I had a arbitration agreement, um, that would that would cover these kind of suits, wouldn't it, and keep me out of court? I, I think so. Uh, and I've been struggling with this because I think uh, somebody who's here in the meeting today, Sam, raised the fact that under California law, uh, everybody's entitled to a jury trial, but I think what um, I think it is permissible to state that you have to first go through arbitration. Maybe it's not binding arbitration, but you have to go through arbitration. I have that clause in my rental agreement, uh, not for quote evictions, that's exempt, but for any kind of a lawsuit where somebody's a slip and fall that you have to go through arbitration. I think that's permissible, and I would definitely put that in your rental agreement. I know I have it in mine. Okay, uh, second question. I think you went over this before, but can I evict a tenant for not paying a late fee? Yes, absolutely. Uh, assuming you have a late fee provision in your contract that is uh, legal and it has to have special verbiage, you can check my late fee provision in my contract. But assuming you do, then yes. And we've been doing that where, let's say it's a $50 late fee uh, and it's in accordance with the current law, then you can serve a notice to perform or quit, giving them three days to pay the $50, and then you have the right to evict. Now, in my rental agreement, I went one step further, and that is uh, if I serve a three-day notice to you, uh, the cost to you, Mr. Tenant or Mrs. Tenant, is $50 or whatever I wrote, and... Um, and I think that's also another way you can do it where you where you have these tenants that will, for example, pay their rent late and you have to serve a three-day notice. And as soon as you serve the three-day notice on the third day, then they finally pay the rent. You could do this every single month. And until you serve a three-day notice, they really aren't guilty of, quote, unlawfully detaining the premises. So the way around that is to, hey, if I have to serve a three-day notice, you got to pay for it. And that certainly is legal. And so is the late charge provision. In addition to that, couldn't I charge them holdover rent? I'm not sure what you mean by holdover rent. Well, they're they're living in the place um, when I gave them notice to quit, and they stay they stay beyond that. Well, in an unlawful detainer action, for example, when you serve a three day notice to pay rent or quit, let's pretend for the month of August, then the holdover damage, and they don't pay, you start your lawsuit in August. The holdover damages start as of September 1, but the holdover damages it really just means the rent owed from September forward in time. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. All right. You have a good week. Julia Jordan, how are you, young lady? I'm good, Dennis. How are you? Good. As always, thank you very much for all you do. Okay. So I have um, actually two different properties in the city of Inglewood. 
and one is a four unit, the other is a nine unit. So um, one of my questions is on the insurance, you, you brought up you know, the issue of insurance. So of course in the rental agreement, the tenants are required to have rental insurance, right? Correct. All right, so my question is, I've been asking for verification because certain tenants are saying, yes, I have it, I got it. And I'm saying, um, you know, send me some kind of certificate of insurance or some kind of court form. And so my question is, what can I legally ask for? And can we request that they list us as additional insured? Okay, well, you can put that into the contract that uh, they have to have it and also that they list you as an additional insured. But that's it's really not relevant. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, First of all, the renter's insurance generally is going to cover two things. Number one, the tenant's personal property. So you don't need to be an additional insurer because you don't need to be compensated for any personal property of theirs that was ruined because a pipe burst in the ceiling. The other okay. thing that it does, which is really important and which you want to make sure that your rental agreement provides for this, that the renter's insurance also must cover their reimbursement if they have to temporarily relocate. So, for example, if there's a problem and you have to move out for a month, the tenants are going to say, okay, you know, put me up at the Ritz-Carlton or, you know, the Four Seasons. Uh -huh. uh, your position should be, look, uh, you are supposed to have insurance which covered that. Now, you don't really care, quite frankly, if they have the insurance or not. All you care about is that they can't look towards you for compensation if these items happen. So, by the way, you can't in the state of California evict a tenant who doesn't get insurance because some silly appeals court came down and said that that's not considered a substantial breach. It's only a trivial breach. But the reason why you desperately want to say you must carry uh, renter's insurance, which not only covers any damage, regardless of how it occurred, uh, to your personal property and also would uh, cover you for any uh, reimbursement if you had to temporarily relocate. You want to have that in your agreement because that means they can't come after you. And that's really all you're trying to do is trying to stop your liability. And in any event, thank you very much, Julia. Good question. We are moving on to a person who I saw at the um, at the convention center. Sam, how are you, sir? Yes, thank you, De and Dennis. Um, I have two questions. The first question pertains to insurance. Uh, with regard to uh, homeowner's insurance or property owner's insurance, which type of policy is better from the standpoint of the insured? A claims-based policy or an, I'm sorry, a claims-made policy or an occurrence-based policy and why? And which one is more expensive? Um, that's the first question. The second question is- Let me stop is, you on the first question. We do one, okay. we do one at a time here. Because you know, when you get old, you can't remember the, the first question. Uh, okay. That's really in a question that you'd have to ask your insurance agent. It's not okay. really something that my law firm deals with. So I really can't answer that question. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, second question and final question is, um, I know that the ultimate physical responsibility for repairs and maintenance falls typically on the residential landlord, but can the, can, the financial uh, responsibility to be contracted away to back to the tenant, say over $25. I do see that in the residential, the um, the California Association of Realtors lease forms. Uh, they specify that over say $25 or whatever is agreed upon will be the responsibility of the tenant, not the landlord. So what if in the amount of the repair? I think that term would violate the civil code, which says specifically the landlord must maintain the premises and gives the laundry list of issues. However, that laundry list dealing with the civil code does deal with uh, major items dealing with habitability. So I guess, theoretically, uh, if long as you say to the tenant, any repair over $25 is the tenant's responsibility, as long as it doesn't relate to these items and you list the same items that are in the uh, civil code. But, you know, the reality is, is that uh, you want to make friends or do you want to make enemies? And if you're going to change it where, I mean, this is as I'm a landlord uh, for, for as long as I've been an attorney almost, 
Uh, and uh, you got to give service as as a landlord. And if you're going to start nickel and diming these tenants, uh, you're just going to make for for a hostile environment. And remember, who's got the power here? You know, with these laws, the tenants have the power. So I just don't think it's a good business model to do so. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to ask uh, Diane to unmute yourself. Hi, Dennis. Uh, thank you for uh, our usual Saturdays. Um, Dennis, I have two situations. Um, the first one, I talked to you a little bit last week, and I have a single family uh, property in L.A., and it's on uh, commercially zoned land, so I could get much more rent. And you had said I can raise the rent to um, you know, whatever I want because it is a single family. But you mentioned something else about that you could also convert it to commercial and I didn't understand that or I'm I mean if you're going to if you're going to um permanently take that rental house off this is in the city of Los Angeles yes okay I mean if you're going to change the use of the property okay then um you could ask the tenant to move uh you'd have to pay relocation money uh, to the tenant, which for a single family residence is only one month's rent. That's different than condos and apartments where it's substantially more. But again, you're in a situation where uh, why go through that trouble? Uh, just because uh, you're going to have to do substantial renovation to turn this into a commercial establishment. Uh, why not just raise the rent? If the tenant moves, well, then that's then, then you can do it at that point. Well, that, that's what we're going to do. And I'm I'm going to do that this week. I'm going to raise the rent and I'm, I don't know, a little nervous about it. But um, I'm also going to uh, send a, the, your lease with the 30 day with just the, um, you know, the other things like like what you talked about with rental insurance and if we have to do major repairs, I, because they've been just trying to retaliate uh, with us because we had raised the rent a little bit before. And uh, anyhow, it's just it's it's a nightmare right now. So one of those situations where you definitely don't want to be a landlord. Um, well, that, my that, other, that we know, darling. Yes. <laughs> um, so my other situation is um, and I, I started to communicate with uh, Jennifer. I, I tried to get you at seven in the morning, but everybody else is getting you at seven in the morning. Well, I always, uh, when people call and and they know my extension, I do immediately take their phone number and say, I'll call them back. And I do call them back. So you'll get a call back at, usually within the seven to eight o'clock hour. Uh, you'll get a call back. And I get about 10, 12 calls a morning between yeah. that time period. We're on to you. So, so anyhow, I, I was on this other property that, you know, it's an old beat up property and the tenant has just begged us to stay. And, you know, her husband died. I mean, it's just one. Wait, is this a single family, family home? Single family city of LA. Okay. And, um, and, you know, we just want to sell it really just like a tear down. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, so I, I thought that I had something communicated with her that we were going to do a cash for keys and, and we want to help her. I mean, we don't want to be mean to her or anything. And and then uh, she came back and she's very innocent. And and uh, she's like, oh, well, the um, these apartments she had looked at want, uh, you know, credit and verification of income. <laughs> she doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, she gets a lot well, of who, cash. Who doesn't? <laughs> one, one right. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm not following the question, Dan, because I do want to move mm -hmm. along here. What's I'm the, sorry. I don't know what to do with her. Is she? How do I get her out? Well, you can't ask her to move because you're selling the property. Because in the city of Los Angeles, all residential units where the tenant has occupied the unit for more than for more than six months requires good cause to evict. So, right. if you substantially renovate, you could do that for a single family home. Uh, if you're going to um, raise the rent, which might have the indirect uh ability to ask the tenant to move so th those are your options anyway thank you very much we are going to move on to austin say hello austin austin are you there there you go say hello Okay, Austin, I think you're having a problem with your mic because you are unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. So let's figure out if you can do that again. I'm going to move on to Fred Morris. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. 
Hello, Dennis. Hello, uh, Fred. Hello. Two quick questions. First one is, uh, I have a triplex in Compton. The tenant just called me yesterday because she got separated from her boyfriend. She's telling me she want to apply for rental assistance program. I've never had to deal with this through my rental career. Now, my... Uh, my my uh, understanding from a realtor friend of mine told me rental assistance program. Uh, once you sign up for it, uh, I can never evict her. Is that correct? Of course not. So tell okay. the realtor that he needs to stop practicing law and do good in selling property. When you say rental assistance, are you talking like the Section Eight program? No, no. It's through the city of LA. She got separated from her boyfriend, so now she qualifies for it. But I do not want to. Well, well I, I, can, yeah, that's yeah. just a, a money giveaway by the city uh, to to the tenant. I, I don't see a problem with that. You're not you're not obligating yourself. They're just going to take care of the rent. They might ask you to verify what her rent is. And um, and I don't, I don't see any I don't see any problem doing that. I'm not a big fan of Section eight. But you're telling right. me this is just where it's, it's basically yes. like a charitable work where they're just going to assist in the payment of rent for a finite period of time. Right. But do I have to, by law, do I have to participate or I can tell her, no, I don't want to fill out this, you know, this paper. You do not have to participate if you don't want to. There's nothing that forces anybody to sign anything in this country. Okay. And if I do participate, that means I can... I don't, I don't think you're certainly not stuck. If the tenant doesn't pay the rent, you have the right to evict. If they bring in a giraffe in violation of the rental agreement, you have the right to evict. Okay, question two, sir. Uh, cash for keys. So this tenant, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. So I have this tenant in Long Beach. She finally agreed to accept cash for keys. I have the property in escrow. It doesn't look she's going to move out by the August 31st, prepare the cash uh, for keys agreement uh, that my realtor sent to me and she signed. Now, if she doesn't move out on the August 31st, but she moves out like September 5th, 10th, uh, do I still have to pay her or since she it would violated depend, that it would depend the terms of how that contract was written? It's through the car forms, through the real estate. Uh, the, I'd the, have uh, to see the forms uh, to see how it was written to see if she forfeits the money. So it's, that's a question I really can't ask. Answer. OK. All right. Thank, All right. You, sir. Thank you. OK, we're going to go back to Austin because I think his mic is working now. Hey, Dennis, how are you? Good. A little technical difficulty there, huh? Yeah, yeah. When you connect your phone to the receiver and try driving with it and talking on Zoom is just a bad mix. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, I am owner occupying a fourplex in the city of Long Beach, and I I cannot put it in an LLC because I'm owner occupying it. So my uh, strategy for um coverage in the case I do get sued, which I'm just going to accept that as a landlord, it's going to happen. Uh, it's not if, it's when. What I did is I is I kept my insurance policy really low at a $300,000 liability limit to keep, um, to keep uh, debt to income ratio really low for my strategy. But then I went and purchased a $3 million umbrella. So my, my question is, based on your experience in this space, what do you think is an acceptable amount of umbrella insurance? Because they typically go in $1 million increments, but you can buy it in any increment, really. So yeah, I, I would go for more of the 3 million than the 1 million because these lawsuits are crazy. And an umbrella policy is, is pretty economical in terms of the price. Uh, I would just make sure that uh, they're willing to step up uh, with your $300,000 worth of insurance that they're willing to cover anything beyond if you get sued. I'd really go through that with your agent, but I don't think it's a bad strategy. Yeah, no, they, they, you can bump it up to, uh, to, to 1 million. Um, and it's probably not that much more. So, yeah. I, okay. I can look at that. And then another quick one. Uh, so I, uh, I may be having to do a cares act eviction and, uh, I serve the tenant a 30 day notice. And um, my question is a 30 day notice when you serve it in the middle of the month is going to lapse into the following month. So 
the following month, the tenant's obviously not going to pay. Do you have to serve another notice on top of that? Or does that next month just get included in the holdover damages when you actually file the eviction? Okay, so for the people out there who want to know what we're talking about, the CARES Act deals, it's a federal law, and it deals with property that has either federally funded loans or you have a Section 8 tenant, something that I try to avoid at all costs. So if you have a Section 8 tenant, then the law requires that you serve a three-day notice to pay or 30-day notice to quit. Unlike a standard three-day notice to pay or quit, this is three-day notice to pay. So you only got three days. If you don't, then you got to get out in 30 days. But there's, there's, even though you're going to get out in the middle, technically in the middle of the month, the if you're suing somebody, you're going to be suing, for example, all the rent that became due for the month of August. Uh, and then the, uh, the damages start or the daily rate starts as of September 1. So there's nothing different that you have to do. Okay. Uh, right. And if the tenant uh, decides that they want to pay, like, you know, they're 10 days into it or something, are you still allowed? If, if you, ex if, if you they don't still have 30 days to pay, they have three days to pay. Three days. If you don't pay within the three days, your only other option is to get out in 30 days. So don't get confused with that concept. Three days to pay or 30 days to quit. If I come to you with all the money on the fifth day, you can tell me I'm not taking it, and you can start the lawsuit 30 days after the notice was served. So I can refuse rent. Very good. Okay, thank you, Dennis. All right, take care. All right, let's go to, it looks like, Arena. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, Dennis. Yes, uh, you, uh, you pronounced correctly. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So this is regarding a single family house in the city of Los Angeles. Um, the tenant uses uh, the house as a business for group home hosting for uh, young adults. So recently he uh, sent me a message on, uh, text me a message on Wednesday. And this is what he said. He said, uh, Irena, I'm trying to get a discount with renewing my liability insurance company for my business. In doing so, they are asking me to hire a licensed contractor to come to the home, inspect and write up a report about the electrical and plumbing just to make sure those things are still in good shape. Um, would it be okay with you if I proceed with the inspection? And he also said that, but if you decide decide for me not to do the inspection, I will be okay with it. So I just want to see what are your thoughts and what are ramification for, you know, even thinking about doing the inspection. Well, first of all, the tenant doesn't need your permission to have a licensed contract to inspect the property. <laughs> he possesses the property. He can have anybody inspect. We're not talking that they're going to do any repairs, but you could have, he can have any a contractor come in and just to test that. So I don't think he needs your permission on that. The only problem that I foresee is that if he does get a contractor in uh, and they find something wrong, then it's going to be your responsibility to take care of it. Maybe right. you maybe you want to take care of it, but that's um, that's what uh, you're going to be kind of forced to do. So again, I don't think he needs your permission at all, uh, okay, as long as he's not that. doing the work. Okay, that's why I thought if he hired a licensed contractor, I mean, the house is built in 1960s, it is old. However, it's functioning, it's 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 good. It's working without- I, I have, I'm, a, I'm I have an issue afraid. with that last statement. You said the house was built in the 60s. I, I was built in the 50s. So oh, what does that okay. tell you? Old? <laughs> It is I didn't mean to take you off. Oh, okay. So, okay. so my my thought is, you know, um, there's no issue with plumbing, electrical. Um, so far, it's working fine. And uh, if I'm, I'm in my mind, you know, the contractor will write up something. If there's something does need to be upgraded, I will be. Uh, I'm I will sure. Be I'm sure the contractor that. will find something. Anytime you yeah. do, you're buying property and you have a. A house inspection, you, you know what you see. It's page after page 
of things that either are wrong or things that should be taken care of. So I think it will open up a can of worms. But you know what? If you want to keep your building and your property up to date, you know, maybe as he, if he's going to pay for it, at least you'll know. Anyway, thank you very much. It's your choice what you want to do with that. And let's move on to Dee Dee. How are you? Hi, Dennis. Thank you. Excuse my voice. I'm a little hoarse. Uh, but uh, I have a couple of questions on a single family home that we are renting in Compton. And um, I believe the tenant has abandoned and left dogs. And so I wanted to know what was the proper procedure if dogs are left on in the backyard. What a wonderful human being your tenant is. Yeah. To lease your property and then leave and leave dogs. Now, did the tenant tell you that he was vacating the unit? Well, that question, well, he has been evicted. And I'm oh, I see. Sure. So he was evicted. I'm not sure if he's in there yet. I'm, I'm in or okay, out. Did, did a sheriff do an eviction for you? It's coming up in about a week. Okay, so once a year, but you think the tenant might have gone? Yes, because he well, put all kind of trash out in front and the front door is... Uh, well, I would certainly know. serve a 24-hour notice to go in that forms on my website. You're going to check the box that states, I'm checking to see if the premises are abandoned. If that's the case, then you want to go in there. I would certainly take care of those dogs. They're probably uh, hungry. I'd get some food and some water for those dogs at the very minimum. Uh, and see if you can contact your tenant to say, hey, what's your intention? Are you out? And if you can, if you know his cell phone, doesn't hurt the call. So uh, I, can, and, I, I am allowed to contact the tenant? In oh, absolutely. Say, hey, you know, the, especially after you go in and you see that the premises really have been abandoned, that he's not living there and he's just leaving dogs there to, to rot in the backyard. I mean, what a terrible human being that is. Right. But... Uh -huh. um, but in any event, um, I would uh, go in there, see if you can contact the tenant. If uh, if the sheriff does the lockout, I mean, technically, you're supposed to hang on to those dogs for 15 days. I know that's crazy, but then then I would call the animal shelter and turn them on him. Okay. Um, and the other question is, I also think he let the utilities um, go unpaid. And how does that affect us in re-renting the property i don't think it will because uh you, the utilities weren't in your name they were in your tenant's name uh what right. city again is this compton compton yeah so you just have to tell them that the tenant has vacated the unit and we have a and you can uh put the utilities back on into my name but i don't think you have any responsibility though some municipalities do uh, require that the owner of the property be responsible for the utilities, regardless of who put the utilities on. I don't think that's the case with uh, with Compton, though. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay, any other questions, young lady? No, that'll be it. Thank okay. you. All right, good question. Let's move on to a Zoom user is what it says here. Zoom user, say hello. I'm going to ask the Zoom user to unmute. If not, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on to Eric S. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Dennis. How are you? I can't complain. Yes, Dennis, I have a question. Um, I got a judgment against one of my tenants um, around March 23rd, 2024. And they stayed over until the eviction happened instead on July 17th. You know, that's, let me let me just stop you right there. That's criminal that the sheriff's office is taking months and months to do an eviction. This is uh, something that I've been talking about that uh, that you we had to wait so long during COVID time to even bring forth an eviction. They finally opened up the floodgates uh, and they opened it up like two, three years late but they did. And now uh, I think through a scheme by the county supervisors of Los Angeles County uh, that they are now slow walking evictions. The sheriff's office is saying that they're understaffed. Well, if they're understaffed uh, supervisors, uh, why don't you staff them? Because it is criminal that landlords have to suffer even more abuse like you just did, sir, where you're 
uh, sitting there for months waiting for them to get out. However, I think I can anticipate your question, correct me if I'm wrong, is you got a judgment on, on one date and yet the tenant stayed in there for four more months. Uh, you can sue for that additional period of time in small claims court. Oh yeah, that was my question actually. Um, and the attorney fees, I'm, I'm stuck with uh, with the cap that I had in my lease of 1200 because we, on that particular case, we ran up over 20,000 in attorney fees. Yeah, no, you're you're capped to what that says, and you and you want to keep a limitation attorney fee clause in your contract because God forbid you lose the case and they're going to come after you for that money. Conversely, if you didn't have that and you got a twenty thousand dollar judgment against your tenant, a lot of times you're not going to be able to collect on it. So it seems that those provisions only hurt the um, only hurt the landlord; they don't uh, hurt the tenant. And one other, one last question, Dennis. Um, if, when it comes to amenities, are do we have to provide the amenities that was advertised um, when we advertise the unit that we may not decide now not to have, or what? What, that, what happens in a situation like that? Like, okay. okay you know, so what I'm hearing you say is that uh, I rented it that it was going to let's pretend have uh, two window air conditioners. And then is this where you're saying that prior to renting it, you decided to take out the air conditioners? What what What's the example? Well, it was supposed to be some gym equipment on the rooftop and then um, some fire pits. But then we we're running into some stuff with um, with the fire department. I don't know, some stuff that, that's going on that we really can't get the amenities that we offer. Our, okay, but our right now, those tenants are in possession? They are, yes. Okay, what city? city of Los Angeles. Okay, so under the RSO, if that's what these are, if you take away an amenity, then you have to give a corresponding deduction in rent. So for example, if I even had a coin operated um, washer and dryer in the laundry room and I took that out, then technically you have to give a discount in rent to the uh, tenant. And that could be like 20 to $40 uh, for each item that you'd have to reduce the rent. So if you advertise the fire pit and there was a fire pit, I don't know what a fire pit's worth, but technically you'd have to give a deduction in the rent. Yeah, we never we never even got the fire pit or anything up there. That's the problem. And the tenants are really complaining now. They're like, they're gonna to sue us or whatever because we advertise things that we are not providing. Right, so, and I, I think they have a, I think they have a, a, a legitimate argument how of course it doesn't say that in the rental agreement about a fire pit right no it doesn't no so you could say hey well even though i advertised that when the deal came down this is what the terms were but i would try to to construct the fire pit if it's in any way possible all right thank you so much dennis all right you take care you know what we're going to try one more time because i can see you a zoom user with your hand raised i'm going to ask you to unmute yourself Okay, I don't think you know how to unmute yourself. It's on, it's on your toolbar on the left side there, I believe, and you have to click on that button. If you don't, we can't hear you, young sir. Okay, well, I want you to know we did try. We're going to move on to Valerie Young. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you for taking, taking my... Thank you for being here. I have a tenant. He exposed himself in front of a video camera to the next door neighbor. She filed a police report. My management company sent him a 10 day notice to quit uh, for and, then, and for possession of the property. And he and they quoted California Penal Code 314.1, which, which is indecent exposure. Did, did my management company send the right uh, notice? Well, normally for nuisance behavior, which is what this is, uh, you serve a three-day notice to quit. What city is your property located in? City of Los Angeles. Is this under RSO? Yes. Okay, so it's permissible to serve a notice that's longer than three days. So, But they have to have magic words in the notice. They just can't say that he violated a penal code by indecent exposure. 
they'd have to have specific things in the notice, the dates and times when that incident occurred and who was the witness. You'd also have to serve notice on the uh, city of Los Angeles, a copy of that notice with their eviction cover sheet form. There's also notices that have to be posted on the property prior to serving that notice. They've made it, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, that they're designing it so that every landlord, without question, will lose their case uh, unless it's unless you're very knowledgeable in this field. So uh, has it been 10 days since the uh, uh, the uh, notice was served? Yes, it's been 10 days and all of the above of what you said uh, went out. Oh, okay, so and at all, that all point, of that went out. I was concerned about the type of notice. Well, and, as long uh, as it has the proper verbiage in the notice, you can give ten days, twenty days, as long as it's at least three days, so you're fine. So obviously, you want to not accept any further rent ever, and you want to bring forth uh, an eviction based on that, and that should be uh, a pretty simple case. We've done the, those cases before, so definitely start that case immediately. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. I see that uh, we have only a few more people. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand now. We're going to move it over to Kathy Yu. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I have two questions. The first one is uh, SB721. Uh, it is very important that uh, the landlord has to comply by the 1st of 2025. Okay, so I'm not really good with code sections uh, when it comes to building codes, but that one relates to that you have to have a contractor check your staircase and balconies. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, so yeah, you have to have a licensed contractor who's certified in staircases and balconies, and that has to be done by January 1st, 2025. Now, Who's going to do this and who's checking it? And the answer is no one's checking it. I don't think the state's going to start sending letters. Where's my certification? But I'll tell you, uh, I would certainly recommend doing it because God forbid something happens where a staircase collapses or a balcony collapses or the railing came down uh, and you didn't comply, then you're going to be in a heap of trouble uh, and your insurance company will certainly be tagged. Uh, the other side of the coin is, is that obviously right now when you buy or sell any kind of income property, uh, it's going to be a requirement that in escrow that that uh, certification be done. So the bottom line is, is uh, there's a lot of companies out there that are gearing up for this uh, work come January 1st. I would certainly um uh, make sure that you get it done. Uh, you know, they they can't find enough ways to make landlords, you know, go under. Uh, it's just another money grab. But again, um, to certify that my balcony is okay, to certify that, I mean, you know, property is built to code. As long as it was built to code, it should be fine. But, you know, you never know in these types of situations. Uh, thank you. My other question is, you tell us to vote for that uh, 33 and 34. No, darling, vote no on 33 because that will take away the possibility to take away of the Costa-Hawkins rule, which would, one thing, the terrible thing it would do, it could potentially do away with vacancy decontrol where you have a tenant who vacates and you might have some municipality who says, well, he vacated, I'm only going to allow you 10% of what he was paying, 10% more. So oh. vote no on 33 and yes on 34. What did 34 say? 34 is really, it, it goes against this guy, Mitch Weinstein. Mitch Weinstein was the founder of the AIDS Foundation. And they take in millions in, in uh, charitable funds. And of course, they're a C corporation, which is nonprofit. So they don't have to pay any uh, income tax. So what he's doing, Mitch Weinstein, uh, he's done this already twice, and this is now the third time. He's trying to, this Tenant uh, Renters Protection Act, uh, 
And what it's doing is to try to go take away Costa Hawkins, which will limit rent increases on single family homes, townhouses and condos, and also will do away potentially with vacancy decontrol. So he's using the AIDS money. This is great. Using the AIDS money, you would think I'm donating to the AIDS Foundation. You would think that money would go for either AIDS victim or for or the health and science of trying to prevent AIDS. But no, he's using it to protect tenants. So Proposition 34 is very clever. It says that if you're a charitable organization and you're nonprofit and tax exempt, then you've got to use 95% of your income that's coming in for the purpose for which your charity is bought. I mean, that makes sense. You know, if I'm donating to cancer research, I'd like the money to go to cancer research. So this one will basically cut the legs off of Mitch Weinstein and the AIDS Foundation that he won't be able to continue to bring forth this ridiculous law, which is really going to put the final nail in the coffins of, of um, income property owners. So Proposition 33, no. Proposition 34, yes. And everybody's got to go down there and just vote their hearts out on this, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are moving along to, let's go to, um, I'll try one more time with my good friend, the Zoom user. Let's see if you can unmute yourself. Have you figured it out yet, young sir? Yes, you did. Third time's the charm. Huh? <laughs> Maybe not. I thought you did. I think you clicked it again. Click unmute. Okay, listen, as soon as this broadcast is over, Zoom user, I'm coming over to your house. I'm going to teach you how to do this myself, okay? I'm going to do it right for you, okay? So make sure that you have some uh, tea and cookies there, okay? Julia, you had another question, young lady. Julia? Nope, I'm sorry. One more time, Julia. I hit the button too much. Okay. There you go. Okay, real quick. Um, okay, so four unit property in the city of Inglewood and there were two storage areas that were rented. Um, long story short, they're, va they're vacant now. I've asked the city to reclass the property back to a four unit because that's legally what it is. And they came back to me and said, will you submit, they want me to submit a formal letter under penalty and perjury explaining my plans for the units that are vacant. Um, question, is that something that your office can work with me to help me write so uh, I don't? I don't, I don't think so. It's nothing, nothing that we can do, but I'm trying to put my head around this. She's talked about that on this property, there's two storage units. Right. Okay, that has nothing to do with the residential living units, correct? Correct. So how many residential units do you have? Four. So I'm not following. What do you want to do with these storage units? There's nothing I can't do with them right now, according to the city. Oh, are you going to try to change them into residential units? We're looking into that. Okay, yeah. so there's nothing that prevents you from, from doing that. Under state law, they have to allow, uh, unless there's some legitimate building code safety violation, they have to allow you to be able to, the ability to change it. So you're going to go from four units to six units. So what is the city asking you to do? Well, if, if okay, so what I told them was, one, they, um, I checked with the city, they will only allow us to have one ADU, not okay, two. Okay, that's reasonable. Okay, so I told them that we were in the process of getting approved plans, and until we get approved plans, we don't know how much the actual construction is gonna cost, therefore, we may have to leave it vacant until it be, you know, it's feasible. Leave, leave what vacant? The the storage unit. Okay, so I mean, obviously, you can't rent it until such time as okay. you have your certificate of occupancy. Absolutely, but yet they want me to write this letter saying that I'm saying under penalty and penalty that I'm going to leave it vacant. Okay, yeah. I don't think I'm follow, following the story, uh, but uh, you might want to call me at the office and I want to take a look at that letter and I'll see what I can do with it. Anyway, okay. ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm actually, let me have one more here that I will take and that will be
the line will end it up with uh, Harold. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, a regular. Dennis, Dennis, can you hear me? I can. How come you were in the Long Beach? I missed it, man. I, you, I, you want me to send a limo by the next time? What do you want me to nice. do? It would be nice. We'll have a good time. We'll talk about the Lakers. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so the the up and coming thirty three and thirty four. Is there any group that thinks like us that we can align with to try to sway uh, the vote? Absolutely, that's a good question. The Apartment Owners Association has a political action committee. You can donate to them. I know in front of my office building right now, it says vote no on uh, Proposition 33 to uh, preserve uh, uh, your rental properties. So yes, I would definitely uh, contact the Apartment Owners Association and give to their PAC. I've done that. And, uh, and of course, I've done so many speeches on uh, voting against uh, Proposition 33. Anyway, thank just, you for your question. Can I just say one more thing? Yes, if sir. If it goes through, when is it valid? When is it? And that's a good question. All that does is it it basically revokes Costa Hawkins and gives municipalities the right to take away vacancy deed control, gives vacancy. So you're going to see Santa Monica and West Hollywood and Los Angeles lining up and saying, we've got to keep the rents down. So and by the way, they'll just decimate the industry, which saying if you if a tenant leaves, you can only get a 15 percent rent increase. This will decimate the industry. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much. I am going to call it a wrap right now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the Zoom Landlord Tenant Talk Radio. I really reach out to everybody to try to help uh, our community because your community has definitely helped me over the years. Anyway, everybody, thank you very much. And have a great weekend. See you next week from Napa.